Okay, so we're gonna, based on our discussion, right, we're gonna focus on uniform convergence and interchanging the limit and integrals. So, <clears throat> so here's the theorem. Alpha B mod function increasing, and each of the function they have integrals. Suppose it converges uniformly. The sequence converges uniformly. Then the limit function has integral, and also the limit and the integral sign can be interchanged. Beautiful, right? So now we're gonna use this there, the supreme one. So we let epsilon n is the supreme of um, f n of x and f x for any x, right? For x between a and b. No. We know that this means that f n of x is less than or equal to epsilon n plus f x and epsilon n minus f x. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Sorry. f x minus epsilon n. Then Here's something important. As each of um whoa, whoa, wait, sorry, 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 no, no, no. It should be F n, right? We're focusing on the limit function. So each of them has integral, and this is a constant function which is continuous, which has integral. So they they all have integral, right? Now this means that this of f n x minus epsilon n d alpha so less than equal to less than equal to the lower integral right of f d alpha and other integral and less than equal to a b of f n x plus epsilon n d alpha right which means that the difference between the upper integral and the lower integral should be less than or equal to two epsilon no two epsilon n of alpha b minus alpha a right you just subtract this and this you get this now as we know that as we know that this is uniform convergence which means that this is true right which means that which means that alpha minus f d alpha less than equal to zero which means that f has integral right now again again we look at this what we have is that um what we have is that Fn and Fd. Oh, we have AB of Fn d alpha minus AB of Fd alpha is less than or equal to the integral of epsilon n d alpha, right? Fn minus yeah, this is like just trivial right and also we have d alpha less than or equal to um f n d alpha minus f d alpha well this means that precisely 
FD alpha, right? Which is less than or equal to what? Epsilon N of alpha B minus alpha A. And again, this goes to zero, right? Which means this goes to zero, right? Which means that this equals to this. Right? And we're done. And here's the instant corollary. So, the proof is simple. We just think about the infinite sums, right? So, if each has an integral and this converges uniformly, then the integral of the series function, which is the series of the integral, you can integrate term by term. So we just let the we just define the partial sum first. N, F K. So we know that G N converges to F uniformly. So we know that. So, okay. Thank you. So we know that. We know that. Um, A B of F D alpha is equal to. A B of G N D alpha. Right. Which is limit of a b n uh, i equals to one right f i d alpha and you can put this out which gives f i d alpha right. And we're done. Now we're going to focus on differentiation. Well, we need not just uniform convergence to imply the differentiation can interchange. We also need a, a more stronger condition. So if the derivative of each converges uniformly, and, and the f n x naught s m x naught it converges so we only not just the different the, the derivative converges uniformly also sum x naught gives this sequence converges well this gives that the function converges uniformly to a function and the limit can be interchanged all right so we're gonna write the proof. So for this one, we're first gonna use the fact that so we'll let epsilon greater than zero. We pick n such that for any m n greater or equal to n, we have f n of x naught. This is like Cauchy, right? Convergence implies Cauchy. And also, the uniform convergence. For any t in this, this is a uniform convergence. Pointwise convergence and uniform convergence. And for this, we apply mean matter theorem. So for any x t, in this interval and we've applied the for the function fn minus fn right which means that we have fn minus fn of x minus fn minus fn of t of x minus t we have this is equal to some f prime n s minus f prime m s right the mean value theorem now for some s then we just we just do simple algebra here this gives 
fn of x minus fn of x plus minus fn of t plus fn of t. This is less than x minus t epsilon b minus a 2 less than or equal to epsilon over 2. Well, this again, we have that fn of x minus fm of x less than or equal to fn of x minus fm of x minus fn of x naught plus fm of x naught. We combine all of the condition we have together and again plus fn of x naught minus fm x naught, right? Well, look at this. This is what? Less than epsilon to 2 because for any x and t, right? And this, by the Cauchy, is less than epsilon to 2. So the whole thing is less than epsilon, right? Which means that fn converge uniformly, say, to f, right? Right. Now, we're going to work on the derivative. So, we fix f. We fix an x first. We fix an x and a, b. And we let t be some point in the interval, but x. We define the sequence of derivative by fn of t minus f n of x t minus x and this is equal to f of t minus f of x over t minus x well we know that what we have is that this is equal to what prime n of x Right. T. Okay, right. So this is by definition because each f and x is differentiable, right? And we know that from here, this star, this star, and this star shows that. phi n of t minus phi m of t it's less than epsilon over 2 b minus a right this yeah yeah we're good and for n m greater or equal to n, we have this converge uniformly, right? Like Cauchy condition <laughs> on where <coughs> <coughs> right. And we know that, and we know that, <laughs> it's equal to phi t, right? <laughs> now, we know that from um, theorem this theorem, right? Each of the phi n, each of the phi n has a limit and we also have the limit of this is equal to the limit of this. Well, if you, if you just do some translation, this shows that
is equal to right so <clears throat> what does this mean this means that the limit of this is equal to some value which means that the limit exists the limit of this exists means that prime x exists differentiable at x right and particularly in particular this is equal to this right and we're done we're differentiable and now we're going to move on before before we saw that in chapter three about sequences we note that every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. But how about if we discuss the sequence of functions? <laughs> well, we're first, we have to define the boundedness of functions, right? So we're going to define two types of bound, pointwise bounded and uniformly bounded. <laughs> well, pointwise bounded means that for each x and e, <laughs> the sequence is bounded. A uniform with bounded means that there is m such that for any n, for any n, for any x, for any x, for any n, this is bounded by m. This is uniform with bounded, which is stronger than bound pointwise bounded. But we note that even if you have uniformly bounded and all continuous functions, and you're on a compact set, it doesn't guarantee that you have a pointwise convergent subsequence. But we're going to prove a special case is that if we have a countable subset, then we have a convergent subsequence on this countable subset. Uh, have a convergent pointwise, a convergent subsequence that converges pointwise on this countable subset, right? Well, okay, so we have to prove this. A pointwise bounded on a countable set, then you have a convergent subsequence. Well, first we arrange the points at E in a sequence, and we know that it is pointwise bounded. So for x1, the sequence Fn is bounded, right? It's a bounded sequence and complex. And by Bolzano Weyers Grass theorem, we have a convergent subsequence, right? So we fix x1, but we're gonna do some construction. So we note uh, a sequence like fik one k one means that this function is a sub is a convergent subsequent for the value x1 for one x1, and k is the kth term, right? So fij is basically xi, the jth term of the convergent subsequence. Okay, yep. And we have this. We have a we have a bunch of. So this is like the for x one, the first term for x one, first second term for x one, third term, and so on. And we move on to x two, and the first term, second term, third term, the convergent subsequence, such that first. We note that we note that for all the terms here, if you input x2, if you input x2, this sequence is bounded, right? Because it is pointwise bounded. If it's pointwise bounded then on x2, the whole thing, the sequence is bounded, right? So there exists a subsequence of this, of this sequence by Bolzano wear stress. It's a repetitive application of Bolzano wear stress theorem, right? So for this, I have a subsequence that converges on X2. So we have so so this is like a subsequence of this. And this again, S3 is a subsequence of S2, is a subsequence of S1. And so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. 
and you have properties. So S and the subsequence of S n minus 1 of the previous sequence. <laughs> and all the sequence converges on the point X n. And another key observation is that the kth element at nth row, say the second element at third row, because this is a subsequence of the previous one, this must appear at least second term or third term or fourth term or 17th term. I don't know, whatever, but it cannot appear before this because it is a, it's a, it's a subsequence, right? So this is this, this is that, this is that. We can't have this, 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 and this is that, right? <laughs> now, we take the diagonal, the diagonal process. So we take this sequence. Well, this sequence converges on each xk, right? Because if we take the diagonal of this whole thing, <laughs> Well, well, this is a term and then this is a term and this, this is also a term and that, right? So this sequence converges on x1. And likewise, this, 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 they're all in this thing. So this converges on s2 and you move on. So this converges on every countable set and by one and two, right? And it is a subsequence because the index of f22 must be greater than the index of f11. So we have the index of fnn must be greater than the index of fn minus 1, n minus 1. This ensures that the index is increasing, which means that it is precisely a subsequence. And the theorem is proven. Now, <clears throat> we have another question. Does convergence sequence has a uniform convergence subsequence? The answer is no. But to get something similar to this, we need to introduce a new concept, which is called equicontinuous, which is a family of functions. So it's equicontinuous on E if, if you're given epsilon. We have a delta <coughs> such that whenever x, y are delta close to, your, close to each other, and for any x, y in the domain, and for any f in the family function, and the family of function, we can all uh, get this inequality, which is really, really strong. <laughs> it's a family of function. They're equicontinuous. Or D is the metric of X, yeah, of course. <clears throat> and I think, yeah. So if K is a compact metric space and if f is in the this the remember this notation the set and k is compact and f n converges uniformly then they are equicontinuous this is theorem so to prove this we first um, use the fact that it converges uniformly on k which means that it is a Cauchy sequence with respect to the metric on this set. All right, so this is the Cauchy. And since F is continuous, all the terms are continuous on a compact space, which means that each function is uniformly continuous, which means that there also exists a delta such that um, for, for all of them, right? Because for any I, right? Then if they're delta close, their output can get arbitrarily close. Now, as n greater than n and dy less than delta, we both we have both this and this, right? So f n x minus f n y. We use the this 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 which is just a triangle inequality, right? Well, this is less than epsilon because um this. This is because the uniform con con continuity. And this is again because of this. Well, this implies it's equicontinuous. Why? Because for any i, right? 
for any n, for i between them, if they're delta close, we have this. And as n greater than n, and they're delta close. So if i is between 1 and n, we automatically have this true for any x, y, delta close. But for n greater than n, n also delta close. <laughs> We get, we still get this, right? So it's equicontinuous. And that's the end of this lecture.